I like hot and spicy, but it does take some getting used to. And I know one car company that will agree with that. That's this week on Motoring 2007. TSN's Motoring 2007 is brought to you by Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward. These were some of the sights and sounds back in 2003 when Porsche introduced its first sport utility, the Cayenne. And let me tell you, there are a lot of people who are not happy with the fact that Porsche was building a sport utility. I mean, how could a company that produces the ultimate thoroughbred sports car, the 911, lower itself to building a truck? Well, we found out quickly it wasn't a truck, and as far as Porsche was concerned, it was strictly a business decision. Well, since then, they've sold over 150,000. This vehicle simply outdid itself. Well, this week, we're in beautiful Spain to check out the new and improved 2008 Cayenne. As Porsche hopes, success builds success. It has certainly changed Porsche. We have sold over 150,000 Cayennes over the last four years since it first started. And we initially planned with 80,000, so it's a big success for Porsche. When we first started, you know, uh, nobody could be 100% sure that it, it, it will work and it will be such a success. But I think it's uh, significantly different. Like, it's, 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 uh, it uh, has the, uh, it's, it's being recognized as a Porsche. It, it uh, really extends the brand and uh, it stands out. For the new generation, we certainly uh, made sure it looked different, but not radically different from the first Cayenne. That's not what Porsche is all about, as you can see on the 911 side, where we've done an evolution over more than 40 years. The most important thing with the new engine is uh, the direct fuel injection system. And with the direct fuel injection system, we were able to uh, increase uh, the performance of the engine and we, can, we were able to reduce the fuel consumption. We have put a totally new engine generation for all three variants and uh, we have added some very uh, nice technology that will do something for the driving dynamics, what we call the Porsche chassis control system. And what it really does is it keeps the car horizontal and it manages a lateral acceleration of up to 0.65. It's an anti-roll system basically and uh, it, uh, it I think does a lot for the active safety of the car. It uh, can be used for comfort also and for dynamic driving. You've always sold sports cars. You've got the Cayenne. What has it done for the business too? It really helps to keep our growth on a very steady line. I mean uh, with the sports cars as you know it's a very uh, up and down business. It can be very good, it can be very bad sometimes. And uh, with the Cayenne, it smooths out that growth. And it really worked over the last uh, four years when the sports cars changed from the 996 to the 997 version on the 911 side. It went down a little bit. Uh, now that the Cayenne is changing, the 911s are as strong as, as never before. So it's uh, smoothing out like a good running engine, really. The future looks very bright. I think we're excited about our product range. Uh, we're excited about uh, the business uh, in emerging markets like China and Russia. Porsche is growing dramatically in those markets. And at the same time, we're still growing at a nice pace in uh, traditional markets. We, we added 7% uh, to our sales in North America last year, which is good you know, for, for a market like that. And so we look forward to doing a lot of business uh, in Canada also. Any pickup trucks on the horizon? I don't think pickup trucks are quite in our product range, so uh, we'll leave that to others. <laughs> Guns, bullets, cars, and gasoline. You're going to have to stick around now, later on Kenzie's Corner.
you know, 20 years of evaluating vehicles, I still have a hard time with one category, and that's SUVs. The reason? Most of them don't have a single sporty bolt in the body. This week on Test Drive, the exception to that rule. The most obvious change to the 2007 MDX is its appearance. Not only is it a much larger vehicle, the exterior design is now cleaner and features Acura's new knife-edge design elements. The overall impression is one of a maturing identity. The rest of the changes, well, they run even deeper and will have an even more profound effect on sales. The all-wheel drive system on this MDX is a little different from the norm. Now, under normal circumstances, when you're trundling down the highway, more power goes through the front wheels than it does through the rear. However, when you get to a fast right-hand off-ramp, the system starts to redistribute the power in a different way. It sends more power to this left rear wheel. Overspeeding it turns the car into the corner. Now that brings stability. Better yet, it means less steering wheel input, which means less body motion, which means yet more stability. The bottom line, they actually use the all-wheel drive system as the first level of electronic stability control. It's a clever idea. Not only did the super handling all-wheel drive system help through the pylon test, it paid big dividends when the last throes of winter conspired to put a damper on the test. Even as the conditions got increasingly worse, the manner in which the MDX powered through corners, well, it did not change. There is a degree of stability there that belies the MDX's SUV moniker. Factor in a good dynamic stability control system and sure-footed is the only description. The anti-lock brakes follow this lead, delivering short 43-meter stops from 100K. Bonus marks for the anti-lock system staying out until it's actually needed. If you have a button fetish, you're going to love this MDX. Within the driver's reach, there's about 100 different knobs, dials and buttons. There's 10 buttons alone on the steering wheel. It's also very technologically advanced. The nav system, for instance, well, it has a bilingual voice activation side to it that actually understands an English accent. The one thing I don't like, buried down in here is a pictogram that tells you exactly what's happening and what the all-wheel drive system is doing and where the power is going. The problem, right about the time it does anything remotely interesting, is the time when your eyes should be on the road because you're mid-fast corner. The suspension and large P255 55R18 tyres also contribute to the MDX's sharp demeanour. While the base suspension is pretty good at controlling body motion, the optional adaptive damper system takes things to a higher plane altogether. When in the comfort mode, it rides and drives like any other MDX. Activate the sport mode and things firm up to the point where body roll becomes almost non-existent and the response to steering is sharp without being twitchy. And remember, when things do get really fast, that all-wheel drive system is there with a helping hand, and so understeer is kept at arm's length. You get a rear DVD-based entertainment system and wireless headphones, a ton of space when the seats are folded flat, and a third row. Now this thing, trust me, cruel and unusual punishment even for the mother-in-law. There's very little knee room, very little headroom. You're better off, if you need seven seats, go with a Honda Odyssey. Lift the hood and you'll find the other major change. A 3.7 litre VTEC V6 that churns out 300 horsepower and 275 pound-feet of torque. While snappy off the line, it's the mid and high ranges where this engine excels. As VTEC does its thing, the engine tone changes almost as dramatically as its work ethic. It's good enough the MDX romps to 100 kilometers an hour in 7.6 seconds and manages the 80 to 120 passing move in a quick six seconds. The five-speed manumatic helps matters as it's very good at keeping the engine at a roaring boil whenever the gas pedal is matted. This latest MDX has got more than a few sporty bolts in its body and it boils down to two important things. First of all, an all-wheel drive system that actively turns it into a corner. The other thing, a great suspension. The fact it's got tons of power is a bonus. That third row seat, well, think of it as being for dire emergencies only.
Michelin, a better way forward. If you're driving on Michelin tires, you can be sure they began life here at the Lawrence Proving Grounds in South Carolina. The 3,300 acres includes over a dozen test tracks. We test tires every way you can imagine and dozens of ways you can't. And we test them every way. It's noise and comfort and hydroplaning and steering feel and maximum braking and I could go on and on and on. The list is endless because often we get a new need in the marketplace or a new tire design and we develop a new test for them. At Lawrence Proving Grounds we do two kinds of tests. Objective, where the computer records the information and subjective, where the, the information is recorded here and, and, and felt here, right, or, or here. Computer simulations and machine tests are wonderful and they'll help us narrow down the final solution, but until computers start buying tires, you're gonna need a human to feel and listen. This happens a lot that when I'm doing a noise test, I have a tire that's louder from 60 to 40 and quieter from 40 to zero. Now if you tested that tire at 45 miles an hour with an objective test, they're going to say, hey, it's the same. Well, it's not the same. The best advice for buying the tire, I'm a little bit prejudiced, but look for the Michelin difference. And the Michelin difference is a tire that will give you long life, good grip in the wet, it'll be quiet, comfortable, good steering feel, excellent emergency accident avoidance maneuvers. Tires are the single most important component on your car. Don't cheap out, get the best value. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Chrysler Nassau concept, a four-door, four-passenger luxury coupe designed for a new beater professional who wants to make a unique statement. Amid the upscale urban parking lots of the future, which will be filled with a new generation of crossovers and luxury sports coupes, Chrysler Nassau stands out by offering the benefits of both in a package all of its own. In some ways, the Nassau recalls the classic shooting brake which in the UK is a term used to describe a luxury coupe with an extended cargo space, often the vehicle of choice of the well-to-do sportsman. The exterior is fluid and sophisticated, exploring a more emotional and artistic expression of what it means to be a Chrysler. That starts up front with a new interpretation of the Chrysler egg crate grille, rendered in polished and satin aluminum. The doors open to a world of luxury, in which all four occupants enjoy a space of their own. Nassau's sculpted interior with bucket seating and high-tech details is especially designed to appeal to buyers with an appreciation for fine design and craftsmanship. The instrument panel is a showcase of new technologies in data display, personal control interface, and home theater inspired entertainment. Rear seat occupants can also enjoy the high-tech entertainment with the video screens and speakers mounted on the back of each front seat headrest. And to top it all off, I'm sure that you'll appreciate the power plant. It's an SRT developed 425 horsepower, 6.1 liter Hemi V8, which drives the rear wheels through a five-speed automatic transmission matched with SRT suspension system to ensure outstanding driving dynamics for the demanding professional. Time to update our long-term Suzuki XL7. The vehicle is Suzuki's first mid-size SUV and the largest vehicle the brand has ever sold in North America. It's bigger and I think much better looking than its predecessor. The XL7 is based on General Motors Theta architecture used for the Saturn View, Pontiac Torrent and the Chevy Equinox. No problem so far, although we did end up with a dead battery one morning. A defective cell was the problem and the battery was quickly replaced and under warranty. The XL7 standard 252 horsepower V6 is designed by GM and built by Suzuki and gives plenty of jump when you need it. Interior, lots of room, especially those back seats. On our next update, a pet peeve.
This week we're on the west coast of Spain overlooking the beautiful Atlantic Ocean, but I do have a pet peeve, and that's with the garbage you find on the freeways and especially on the country roads. Now I know Spain is not alone with this bad habit, but maybe somebody should introduce the Adopt the Highway program here. Just an idea. Anyway, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Brad, one of my pet peeves, you hit on it right there. I can't stand seeing debris and garbage blowing around. It's such a blight on a beautiful country. But anyhow, what I want to talk about this week is the pavement that we encounter with our vehicles and rough pavement, potholes, and the kinds of damage and things that happen to your car from driving over that kind of pavement. Now, pothole season is probably the most damaging to your car, and as many of you have found out, you know, it can be bad news for your tires, rims, suspension, steering linkage, etc. if you hit significant ones. Uh, hard enough at high enough speed and with under inflated tires to boot can be real trouble. So your first line of defense for driving on rough pavement, yet another good reason to make sure you maintain proper tire pressure. If your tires are under inflated, the tire will get pushed in against the rim, cut or damage, possibly blow the tire, maybe bend the rim and maybe bend some components in the steering and suspension linkage. So that is always your first line of defense. Not over inflated, not under inflated, pressure bang on. Consult the uh, tire pressure placard on your vehicle and adhere to those specs. Now, if you run through some potholes that give you symptoms afterwards, things like a shimmy in the steering wheel, vibration, maybe noise, steering wheel a little bit off center and or car pulling one way or the other, you've definitely incurred some damage to that vehicle and it's time to get it in right away and get it looked at. Now, if it's just basically long-term exposure to rough pavement, in other words, after pothole season, end of April, 1st of May, something like that, good time to get your car in, get the suspension looked at, inspected. If it's got grease fittings, get them lubricated. Maybe think about getting a four-wheel alignment done, check the shocks and struts and everything in that steering and suspension linkage for any wear or damage, replace the bad components and get that alignment done. Think about things like rotating your tires, maybe replacing the tires, these will all help. Now, vehicle selection also has a huge factor in how well you encounter, how well you deal with those potholes. A vehicle like this that has 60 series tires, we've got about three inches between the road and the edge of the rim, but on a light truck or SUV, this one, for example, we're knocking on the door of six inches between the rim and the road. So that bigger tire, bigger diameter steps through the pothole easier. Now, if you do happen to hit the mother of all potholes and you've done damage to your vehicle, you may have some recourse against the city or town you're operating in if the roadway was not up to spec. But you need to initiate a claim fairly quickly. Seven days in some areas, 14 in others. It varies depending on the jurisdiction, but you can't wait forever. They've got to go out and check out that location. And if the roadway was not up to spec, you may be able to get financial compensation. If they check it out and it was up to spec, obviously you're on your own and you had a situation where maybe your tires were underinflated, you were going too fast, or maybe a combination of the two that caused the damage to your vehicle. But if you've got the damage and the symptoms I mentioned earlier, don't ignore it. It won't get better. It won't go away. You've got to fix it and you're better to do it sooner rather than later. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2007. The last federal budget included a couple of provisions of interest to motoring viewers. First of all, they've applied penalties up to $4,000 for the purchase of fuel inefficient vehicles like Hummers and giving rebates of up to $2,000 for hybrids and other efficient vehicles. Well, that's just stupid. I mean, the point is to reduce the amount of CO2. That's not a function of the kind of car you buy. It's a function of the kind of car you drive. Let's say you buy a Hummer and drive it 2,000 kilometers a year. Or you buy a hybrid and drive out 100,000 kilometers a year. Who's putting more CO2 into the atmosphere? Obviously. So the point isn't control the vehicle, it's control the fuel. It's like Chris Rock says about shooting people in the States. He says, you don't control the guns, control the bullets. You make them $1,000 each, you're going to think twice before you pop some guy. You can't afford it. Now, in a passenger car situation, exactly the same deal. It's like... Gasoline is free in this country. I mean, we whine and moan about the price of it, but 
A bottle of water in your gas station costs more than gasoline does. You want to reduce the amount of gasoline used, you raise the price. And besides, how many Hummers do they sell in this country? Like 50? I don't know, not very many. But there's tens of thousands of big old tanks out there that are chewing up gasoline like it's going out of style. Are they going to be affected by this? Not a chance. As long as gasoline's free, they're going to keep driving these tanks. If you crank the price up by a couple of bucks a liter, hey, they're going to think twice. They'll buy a new vehicle. It will be more efficient, and it will be cleaner, too. Now, am I the only one that's figured this out? No. You look at Europe. Fuel is expensive. Cars are small. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, I've always been a Porsche fan, and like others, I was not happy when Porsche decided to come out with a sport utility. And even now, if I had my choice and the money, I'd take a 911 or maybe my favorite Porsche product, the new Cayman. But having said that, Porsche was right in its decision. As we saw earlier, the Cayenne has been a huge success, and it's added another model into the showroom and attracted new customers. But you know, sales did dip in 2006, which is natural for a model at this age, and why Porsche has come out with a new and improved. And yes, after a short time behind the wheel, the new 2008 Cayenne is a big improvement, but most of those improvements have come under the skin. Interior and exterior design has remained the same. So it'll be interesting to see if sales will be on the rise once again. Time will tell, and of course, we'll take a much closer look at the new Cayenne on a future test drive. But that's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. He makes no bones about it. He's, I think he said 98% of the people that go shopping for a new car, Mitsubishi is not even on the list. They don't even think in terms of Mitsubishi. I think it's quite good for him to admit that. Cause I guess it gives him a starting point. But yeah, he's right. I mean, Mitsubishi aren't even on the map in Canada. They should be, and then maybe they will be, but no, they're not just yet. TSN's Motoring 2007 has been brought to you by Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward.